Let's just make sure we are live. How do we see that? Can you, can you make sure? So, third time, hopefully charm. Thank you guys for your patience. Uh, my name is Amir Glogau. I am the founder and CEO of Guidely. Uh, Guidely is a personal development platform that leverages technology and story to create powerful connections between people who want to become their best possible selves and experience guides who are coaches, mentors, teachers, and healers. Through our sophisticated matching process, we unite people for a journey in personal and spiritual growth to ensure no matter where they where you are on your journey, you are never alone. Mm -hmm. And I'm thrilled to have Hargill and Helen here. Hargill Hendricks and Helen LaKelly Hunt are international respected couples therapists, educators, speakers, and New York Times bestsellers, best selling authors. Together they have written over 10 books with more than 4 million copies sold, including the timeless classic Getting the Love You Want which I had the pleasure and some pain to read and implement. So thank you for the growth and the pain. <laughs> I am sorry, thrilled to have sorry you. about the pain. Yeah, yeah, yeah. well, you know, yeah. so I, I'm really excited to, uh, I've been following you and reading you and, and watching you so many times, so many for such a long period. And I'm, I'm really sorry that Shannon, my partner, uh, is not next to me today. She had to attend her daughter. She is uh, my uh, she is my partner in life and my partner in Guidely and uh, uh, typically sits in studio with me uh, and we've been following your uh, your methodology as well so thank you for uh, your sharing your wisdom. So we're, you, we're honored that we are being asked. Thank you. Thank you. So before we start with your methodology or your uh, you know um, insights, I want to ask you what love is to you. When you say getting the love you want, what is love? What is love? Ah. Uh, well, Harlan and I talked, and I'm going to jump in with the answer. Um, uh, Imar, you mentioned uh, even before we got on, and then again, um, you have loved that um, feeling when you when you got married. And, uh, and then y'all had struggles. And um, uh, you mentioned uh, a little later near the end, end of our time together, you're going to talk, is there a point that you give up? And uh, guess what? Harv and I uh, gave up once and we announced to our family and announced to the Imago Therapy community that we were divorcing. And that day, which was the worst day of my life, uh, really has become the best day of our life because first, we think if you've been in love, you there you ne there is no such thing as the hopeless couple. There's always hope. So, um, uh, two other. So we'll talk about that later. What uh, what happened with us? We'll give you an example of the hopeless couple, and what we did uh, to not be hopeless anymore. But. Um, uh, I, when I was um, looking for someone to marry, Harville was beginning to give talks on relationship. This was 40 years ago. And uh, he, he was just giving little speeches in a city we both lived in, Dallas. And I went to one of his speeches and he said, relationships, three stages. There's romance. Uh, the, but everyone who falls in romantic love ends up in the power struggle, stage two. But with certain things, anyone in the power struggle can get to stage three. And I went, oh, what's stage three called? He said, real love. So in our opinion, love is a process that goes through three stages. Romance, everyone in the romantic stage ends up in stage two power struggle and then there's stage three so um uh, my last comment to answer that question the person who impacted me the most as i was trying to figure out love was martin buber and the book the i it the i thou mm -hmm. that you either treat your partner as an i it at the altar 
you said you and I are one and now we're married, right? Nope. And I'm oh, the one. No, I'm the one. Oh no. No, no I'm, I'm the, the one. one. <laughs> no, I'm the one. I thought you loved me. Oh uh, well. Oh, you don't love me? And so so anyway, it's two people trying to figure out are um you know, you think you love someone, but you think they like what you like. And so then you wake up and they see things differently. So Martin Buber said, no matter um, if you want to love someone, you cannot treat them as an it to serve your needs. Rather, hmm. you What's put aside news your, your needs and you treat them like a thou. And Buber says, when uh, someone treats another person as a thou, the universal energies of love are constellated and reside in the space between the two people. Right. It's sort of like there's a physics that brings love into the world. And it's when we treat each other as a thou. So that's my definition of love. Hmm. That's, that's so beautiful. That's the first time I've heard that definition and it's so beautiful. It's touching. Um, so, so, you know, the, the reason I, I want to I want to talk for a second about the force that brings us to want to be in a relationship, like, or to get out of a relationship. Like, what is it? What is that? The force that brings us into the relationship. Yeah. Well, that's um, that's the force that creates uh, romantic love, bringing us into the relationship. And what when we call it partner selection, how in the world do you wind up with the person? that you're with and that took us a long time to figure out but what uh what we learned over the years of listening to couples is is uh, is, a, is a chronic story that uh when they were little because you always explore childhood when they were little uh, they lived with a, a, a caretakers uh who uh, met some of their needs so that they are alive and well and you know can come to therapy and work and function but there was something not met in childhood that was critical in the ecology of the child's mind for survival. Mm -hmm. And so there was a feature of the caretakers that didn't function for the child. <clears throat> and that creates what we call an imago, an image, and that, that's recorded. There's this like a painting inside your skull. And when you grow up, uh, to become an adult and go on what we call the search and find mission for that person of your dreams, the person you're looking for is a specific type of person with specific traits. And those traits, you know, this is the paradox of the traits that are similar to the traits of the caretaker who did not meet your needs. So that when you see the person <clears throat> across the crowded room, as Helen said in stage one, who did not who, who, who triggers your interest and you move across a crowded room, what you do not know is that unconsciously you're being drawn to a person who is similar to the caretaker who did not meet your needs. And the reason that you're so attracted to this person is that unconsciously there's, an ex, there's a merger of that image with the caretaker in your mind. And an expectation goes with that, that this person will meet that need that was not met in childhood. And of course, since they're like the caretaker who did not meet the need, you fall in love with them and you expect them, okay, pony up now. <laughs> I'm supposed to be getting that. And of course, they can't do it. And when they don't do it, that then produces disillusionment, disappointment. That leads to the power struggle. where And both people go through the same process. And both are married to somebody who at the, um, almost at the characterological level, cannot respond to your deepest unmet childhood need. However, this is the thing that took us years to figure out. Um, and that is that there's, uh, there's, a, there's a piece of me that didn't develop in my childhood with my caretakers. Uh, like, like for me, I grew up on a farm, feelings were not very useful, uh, so I didn't develop. But the, a brain was, you had to learn how to do things and fix things and repair things. And so I became a cognitive left brain person. So I didn't develop that part of me. So I'm attracted 
uh, and obviously, therefore, that that didn't. So when I marry Helen, guess what she's going to want? The emotional, she's going to want, the emotional the of, she's going to want emotional responses, the part of me that didn't develop. And guess what that means is that what her need is, is the biggest gift to me because it asks for me what I didn't, what, I, what I'm not, what I didn't develop. Not what I'm not, but what I didn't develop. So is to respond to her uh, wish for an emotional relationship. I get to activate my emotions and become the whole person that I was before I lost them when I was a child. So that 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 um, that conflict of difference is the uh, and nature was brilliant in setting this up, or God, or whoever set all this up, <laughs> was really brilliant because you always marry somebody who's going to want the part of you that's not developed. So in order to respond to them, you have to develop it. Then guess what? You get it. When you develop it, it's yours. Now you are a whole person, and you wouldn't have been that without that particular need system that in the person that you married. And so that's mutual. So Helen has to grow in my direction about what I need. I have to grow in her direction. And so we, in a sense, finish each other's developmental stages. We help each other complete each other in, a, in our own being. And in that sense, we become partners in the project of growing each other into wholeness. And in the process of doing that, we develop a relationship that we would call a partnership. So it's something like that. It's beautiful. I have uh, I have so many questions. I have to prioritize which one uh, which one I'm going to voice out uh, first. But so so two comes to mind. One is so the the high percentage of divorce right now and the struggles in relationships is that because people get stuck in what you call stage two in the power struggle and press the eject button or and I and I talk also about you know younger audience. I just okay, romantic, 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 romantic. Yeah. How do you get? Some people uh, don't even get to stage two. You know. They so, don't even. Yeah. Yeah. The um, well, the um, let me go back to the um, re I, I sort of lost the reframe of the first part of that question. Uh, would you do that again? I was following. I was following the thing about younger people, and then I lost where we entered this question. Uh, so, so I asked, what, "What the divorce? Why is the divorce rate? Oh, yeah, why is the divorce? Why is people get stuck in power struggles?" Yeah. Well, I, I think I think I'm I'm going to answer based on the fact that we've had 48 years of listening to couples, and that so I answer comes from clinical experience, but it's also a lot of research that also supports this. Okay, that the, and I have a comment after your finish. Okay, and the that the okay, you want to go first? I can. Okay, um, but you're responding and, to the question. Amir, why the divorce yeah, rate? Amir, uh, for the first time in the history of the world, the relational sciences are teachable, and people don't know that they're easily taught. Mm -hmm. We actually think that um, when people consider. A mar getting married and getting a marriage license that it should be like a driver's license everyone needs to read a manual and then pass a test before they get like drive like a driver's license and if they fail the test they have to read the manual again and if they pass they get their marriage license because it's so simple and Harville I give him a lot of credit and he gives me a lot of credit um, well no I think Harville's genius is simplifying to complex because any couple, when they fall in love, it can be everlasting if they do four things. You know, you just have to do four things. Number one, learn to mirror each other. Uh, learn the dialogue process, number one, because we're taught to talk, we're not taught to listen. And monologue has been the way people Pharaohs talked and kings talked and people in charge talked and that doesn't work anymore. You have to learn dialogue and then uh, then there are three other things you learn and your any relationship can be transformed. Yeah. So so I think that the people who keep jumping around they don't know there's a way you can find everlasting love. Yeah. So I it's just, not marketed <laughs> and, yeah. and maybe if it were it would it, people would 
want to learn the process. Yeah. And I think that's one of the reasons why a divorce occurs is that uh, divorcing couples don't know if they have options, um, that there is information that is available. The problem is it's not in the culture like the stuff about romantic love is. You know, you find your, your soul partner and there's all kinds of data about that. But there's the culture doesn't teach us how to be in relationship. It teaches us how to look out for yourself. And if things are not, and this has been true for the past 200 years, ever since the, the Enlightenment, when the shift in culture moved from monarchy to the freedom of the self to find its own partner and parents didn't pick your partners anymore, became you know, arranged marriages ended. Uh, that that produced that. But so there's no information that people can say, OK, we're in trouble and uh, we know what to do. Uh, now we just have to decide to do it. They can't find it. It's in it's in, in in therapy sessions. It's in research journals. It's in special things like this. But it's not out there in the culture that people breathe every day. But the other piece of why people uh, divorce is so, so they don't know what to do is they do get to the point where they say, um, <clears throat> you know, you're just not producing what uh, you said you would do. And they didn't say they would do it. You come with the unconscious expectation that they're going to do the magic thing that you need that you didn't get in childhood. And you don't. And, and most of us don't even know that dialogue is going on. The dialogue of the self with the self about childhood. I didn't get. I didn't get enough emotions. I didn't get enough attention. And I'm coming into the world because you're similar to the caretaker with whom I grew up who didn't give me that. So you're supposed to give me that. In other words, you're supposed to finish the developmental process. And at some point, uh, the the uh, alienation uh, reaches a point where uh, people become so disillusioned and angry that they simply give up. And it's still the case that around 50% of all couples in the Western world, at least, and it's even higher in newly democratized um, non-Western worlds, like Korea, now has a 70% divorce rate. Wow. We have a, and it's, you know, it, it's become a, a democratic uh, country. People are picking their own partners. And, and about 50 years ago, if you were in Korea, you, you married the person your parents picked. And right. it's, it's been that recent. So it's a lack of information. It's also reaching the point of desperation where you just say, I've got to go somewhere else. And this is then where you get on that, um, what the, uh, I think it's in Buddhism, they call it the dirty brown prayer wheel. <clears throat> you start going, <clears throat> you look for somebody else. And you say, well, I'm, I'm, I'm find somebody else. So you'll find somebody else. What you don't know is you'll find somebody else similar to the person you divorced. Because your brain is what's doing the search. You're not cognitively doing it. Because if you did it cognitively, you'd pick somebody you were not attracted to. So when your unconscious uh, is doing the search, it picks somebody who activates that expectation. That's what makes it so exciting. Wow, that's expectation. I'm going to get hugged by this person. And you don't know you, you're falling in love with a non-hugger that doesn't do physical stuff. They're cognitive and they can tell you, I love you and I'll take you on trips, take you out to dinner, but we don't do, we don't do the hugging and touching and stuff like that. <laughs> well, that's what I want. I don't care about dinner. I want to be hugged. So I think that those are the two things that you reach the impasse and you don't then have information to know what, what to do after that. And the thing that Helen was alluding to, it's really simple how to move out of the impasse. It's really very simple, and we can talk about that. And it's tragic for us that that simple uh, solution is not readily available. So Ellen has come up with, let's make it a law that you got to go get it before you can even get married. Well, and uh, let me um, add, Harville one day um, said, let's get this out of the clinic into the public. Uh, yes, there's imago therapy, so you get help if you are in pain and you see an imago therapist but you said helen this is so simple it can be taught in school even kids in kindergarten yep. can learn this so we started something called safe conversations and we have a training program kids can learn this mm -hmm. and and um and we also 
think universities and pre we it's been taught in pre-k in israel and kids love oh, wow. i was gonna yeah. say someone oh, wow. in israel uh, like more like 30 years ago 15, in israel, 15, years, 15 ago. years ago she said let's get this into preschool she was an imago therapist who yeah. had a friend who was a, a teacher and and pre-k and they said what well, let's teach them the kids dialogue love it and we just didn't follow up with her but we should and the kids, what the, I can, will never forget the report is when the kids learn about uh, Mirami, and so mirror, mirror back, the kids would go to their parents yeah, and say, they Mom, took it mirror home. me. They took it <laughs> home. Mirror me. So they learned they had to train the parents in the process. Couldn't just train the kids at school because the school kids would then go home and expect the parents to right. Learn right. How right. respond to them. And the yeah. parents didn't, didn't know what to do. So they learned you have to train a whole system to do it. So, so that it works there. So I, I have a whole ideas about how that can be maybe scaled and, and integrated. But before we talk about the method, because I want to dive into you know those three other steps you talked about yeah. uh, the conversation method. Before we dive into that, you know you talked about the the family structure that under monarchy and in the past of you know just deal with what you have and that's it and there is no and and now everything is trend, trending towards individuality and yes. people people are afraid to lose their individuality and get lost in the relationship yes so so how how do you find that balance you know from not swimming from one side to the other you know i i i have this concept of when i'm in relationship i want to be i want to feel one right i want to i want to be one with my partner, but also want to be just myself. So how yeah. do you find that balance? Well, I think the, um, the, it's a paradox in my mind. It's okay. a paradox. And I have a comment after yours, if it, you it, want. Okay. The paradox is that in order to take care of yourself, you have to first take care of your relationship. And this is in fact, just obvious that if, oh, I have goosebumps. You have goosebumps. Can you, can you say that again? Yes, that it's a paradox that in order to take care of me, I have to take care of us because we are a context in which I live. Mm. And if I don't take care of the context, just like if we don't take care of the planet, the you know, the planet's gonna we don't know even that the virus may be the planet saying i need to get rid of a few people there's too many people here but yeah. if we don't take care of context then you suffer the fact that the context is not functioning but you're the responsible for taking care of the context because when you have a good context then you live in the context that you created whether it's good or bad so in order for me to have my needs met and to live with safety, which is what you have to have in order mm -hmm. to thrive, I have to take care of what Helen and I call the space between, but also the space all around. I have to take care of the whole of the whole context. Now I have a context that takes care of me. And if you just think about this, when, couple, when couples become parents, they are the context for the child. So the child is going to be a function of the context of the, of the caretakers. If those caretakers are healthy and happy and normal, the child's going to grow up without all kinds of problems. But if there's problems in the context, the child's going to grow up and will have been a benefactor in a negative sense of those problems. So it's not like anything radical. It's just that in the 18th century, we got something wrong. But I think we had to do it because we had been in monarchy so long where there were no selves. You were just serfs and you belonged to the king and you belonged to the religious organization, mainly the Roman Catholic Church in the, in the, in, in the Western world. So, uh, so when the monarchy broke down and democracy emerged in the uh, Renaissance and in the Enlightenment, uh, what was focused on was personal freedom, personal autonomy. And that means I can now choose my own partner. I can choose where I want to work. I can choose how I want to make my living, where I want to live. And you couldn't do that under the monarchy. 
So right. this, so we had to become selves in order to finish getting free from the obstruction and a repression of the monarchy. Um, but what we didn't do along the way was realize that we lived in a context that we needed to take care of the family. We needed to take care of the community. We need to take care of the planet and that would take care of us. But we got to focus on the self and we became the me too generation. It's, the, it's all about me, the me generation, not the me too, but the me generation. So the paradox is that if you want to be taken care of, you have to take care of the relationship. And if you want your relationship to thrive, you have to help take care of the community so that your congregation is a healthy place, so that your corporation is a healthy place. It has to become contextual first. And and I think I want to say one other thing. This is, this is going to go high level now, 90,000 feet. Yeah. We've been working on uh, quantum uh, field theory. In quantum field theory, it's really clear reality in that theory is a field in which there is nothing. It's just a field of energy. <laughs> This in, in obviously intelligent energy and creative energy, but it's a field. And in the field, forms arise, which is you know, particles, atoms, people, universes arise. So, but what is fundamental and first is the field. So if you think about context as the field, everything is going to arise out of the field. So if the context is faulty, it's going to produce damaged individuals. And if your relationship is not safe and healthy, you're going to struggle. So you have to take care of context or the field in order for the form, which is you, to thrive. And that means ultimately this space has to be safe. It's that simple. It's not complex at all. If it's not safe, you're going to suffer. So two more points. Uh, um some decades ago, Harvard University just decided to study what happened to graduates of Harvard University, and they mm. picked another college or university in Boston uh, that had more people of color. And for 30 years, at the end of the, uh, the year, the person who graduated submitted a report, and they did a report. And, and the question was, what makes life worth meaning? And for 30 years, they studied the graduates of these two universities. And guess what the answer was? Was it how many homes do you have? Like, yeah, you, and how big? Uh, how many cars do you have? Um, how many degrees you, do you have? How much money do you have? Does that make life worth meaning? Uh, and you know, does that make life Meaningful. Meaningful. Yes. And, um, you know, because this is what we strive for, prestige, power, and, um, and material things. And at the end of this form that they filled out, the um, results of the 70-year study was what had made life meaning was their personal relationships. That's what was the important thing. Yeah. But by the end of their life, it was you know, how, how they felt, how they felt about the important people and how those people felt about them. And then um, the last thing I would add to what Harville said, so anyway, it's been documented scientifically that right. relationships give life meaning, even though when you're 30 or 40, you go, okay, how many people can I fuck or something mm. like that <laughs> or something. <laughs> Anyway, the second thing. Oh, that, uh, well, I, what about how many cars can I own? So, so the second thing is I have loved brain science. And Mayo Clinic came out about a year ago with a documentation that people with healthy relationships live longer, don't get sick as much, and have a stronger immune system no. with which to fight off COVID. So, and this is because you can live in the lower part of your brain where you're anxious and the neurochemicals that get released are serotonin and um, adrenaline and, um, you know, gimme, gimme, gimme. No, you got something, I want it. No, you got, no, I want that. And it's sort of like, um, by the way, I thought I might like you, I don't, bye. And, uh, you know, you, you bug me. And anyway, it's a part of the brain that, 
that's very choosy and um, picky and, and rejects a lot. And the upper part of the brain is the neocortex, especially the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex releases dopamine, acetylcholine, norepinephrine, and serotonin, relaxing neurochemicals. And when you're in a relationship that feels safe, you, um, you feel so good. And people don't know that. They think it's happiness is out there. Mm -hmm. And happiness is in the space between where, where you feel safe. And you practice what Martin Buber said. You know what? And Harville says, difference is the human problem. And you know what? We see things differently. You know, I think today, let me just honor the way you want things and practicing making other people a vow. Mm -hmm. And that's yeah. what consolates an energy field. No. We don't know where love comes from. We don't know who made love. Why is it? What is it? And Martin Buber says it's, it's an energy field that flows from out somewhere, a universal energy field mm -hmm that suddenly begins to flow between two people mm -hmm. when they practice a listening to the mm -hmm. other and saying, is there more about that? Yeah. And if I value, as Martin Buber would say, then I remove all judgment and therefore it becomes a safe relationship. And guess what? Oh, I just want to underline what you said. You're going to live longer. And, and feel and, better. And you're going to have fewer diseases, your immune system is going to work. But if you have all these negative neurochemicals going through, your immune system is impaired and you're vulnerable to physical illness, not just emotional, but physical. So we say relational health, which you achieve by developing relational competency, is the best thing you can do for yourself. Mm -hmm. And that's the paradox. Mm -hmm. But people don't know that. So those of you who are listening to this, yeah. George, get it, let's get to know each other. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Spread the word. So, so, you know, you talked about the romantic love, the power struggle, um, and now you got us curious about why is it worth going through the power struggle? There is live longer, feel better, be happier. Yeah. How do you get from that power struggle to the true love to the Tao. Yeah. Uh, how, how do you get from phase stage two to stage three? There are four things. You want to start? I'd like to start with dialogue. And uh, or which one would you like? Well, we can name, I mean, I always name the four. You want to name the four? Well, the four first um, dial people need to learn dialogue. We are not taught that in school. And we mean a new way to talk is the dialogue is just a technical term. You have to learn a new way to talk. You take turns. And I would love to dig in, in, and I would love to dig in how how okay. you recommend dialogue. But so you, you, take, you take turns talking and listening. There's a sheet, and you have to answer the question of what is dialogue before you get your marriage <laughs> license. Okay, so oh, then okay, so you're this, making up the test. Uh, the way. second thing is a commit to zero negativity. It's not what you say; it's how you say it. So you can bring up any frustration, any problem, mm -hmm. and we have tools to teach you to um, solve problems in a way that doesn't bring anxiety to the other person mm -hmm. and, and, and that increases the chance that they want to problem solve with you. Number three, identifying a childhood challenge, and that creates empathy between two people if if I learned out, we say, were you intruded upon growing up all the time? Caretakers or parents telling you, you should be this way. You should do this. You, you're, you look sloppy. Go back and change your clothes and da, 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 da. Or were you abandoned? Did your, did one of your parents die? Did they divorce? Did, were there so many kids, no one noticed you? Did you not have? have anyone there for you so were you either treated upon or neglected and then last is fun having fun having joy and um, we think fun and and yeah you have and to amplify spirituality pleasure. Have to amplify are connected 
we have a definition of holy yeah. that is about fun. <laughs> so, <laughs> that so we told uh, Amir right before the thing, but we'll maybe get that, to that later. So, so why don't <clears throat> unpack a little bit the the dialogue process because that's the mechanism, and it, zero negativity and empathy and pleasure are all additives. But if you don't do dialogue, you can't do the others anyway. Um, so what we call dialogue process is what Helen just said. It's, it's very simple. It's one person talking, the other person listening. But you're talking and listening in a special way. Um, and just to make it simple, we keep, keep trying to make it simple. It's talking. When you're, you're talking without judging, talking without criticizing. And that's really hard to do because most of us are into... Uh, fixing you, making you better, put it, pointing out what you need to do better. But you have to learn to talk without criticizing. And then secondly, and, and uh, so we think talking is the most dangerous thing people do. So if we don't learn to talk without criticizing, then we actually hurt, are hurting each other most of the time. So that means we're unsafe. Secondly, listening is the, is the most infrequent thing human beings do. Uh, you know, we hear, but we don't listen. And often, I, I the other day I was using a phrase that I'm going to start bringing in, is we have we have receptors or deflectors. And most of the time when somebody's talking to you, you have deflectors because you're waiting for them to stop so you can counter them and put out your own point of view or point out how they're wrong or just say your point of view about the same thing. Uh, can, we, can I share with you a phrase uh, a friend of mine uh, uh, shared yes. with me a few years back? He says, we tend to drive cars with two gear shifts. One is talk, and the other one is waiting to talk. <laughs> <laughs> we don't have the listen. That's beautiful. But, yeah. That's beautiful. I'm, yeah, while you're talking, I'm waiting to talk. And yeah, we yeah. call that parallel monologue. There's no dialogue there. But listening is when you have receptors and you know that you're listening when you're changed by what you hear, i.e. you actually let something in and it becomes, it resides then in your memory system, which means your memory system now includes what this person's view of the world is. So now you're listening. That doesn't mean you have to agree with what the person is saying, but you must receive it. And this is the polarization going on in our culture right now. Wouldn't that be amazing if we could, in fact, if the Democrats could, in fact, receive the Republican point of view and vice versa? Because both uh, are, are scared. That's all that's going on is fear. And so it shows up with denigrating the other point of view, thinking that that's going to make us safe. But it makes us more dangerous. So, uh, so it's talking without judging, listening without uh, criticizing and so you can connect and this is the human dream is to connect beyond difference now that's the next hurdle because most of us do not know that difference exists we assume the world that we live in is the world you live in and the fact of the matter is no person, no two people live in the same world, even if they live in the same house and have been married as long as Helen and I have, which is 40 years. We live in different worlds. So that simply has to be accepted. We call that differentiation. Helen lives in a world that is not my world. And if I judge it, then I want her to give up her world and live in my world, which means I want her to disappear and that's called emotional annihilation. So if you go away, don't be who you are, then I will live with you. But you'll be a copy of me. That's, you know, it, it, if you think about that, that's really absurd. But that's the normal interaction that all of us have in everyday life. So what we have to do is get it that the other person is not you. So connecting beyond difference means I accept that you, you live in a different world. I accept the difference that is there. I don't have to like it. 
I don't have to become that, but I have to accept the fact that that is as valid a world as my world is. Now, that's a really hard stretch because that means that I have to give you equity with me, even though I disagree with you. How could, how could your point of view be equal with mine if it's wrong? Uh, you know, but so anyway, so that's, that's, the big hard, that's the big hard part about that. So, so that's called, um, uh, the, the, that's the basic definition of dialogue. Then there are steps. Oh, could I? The, the, there are three steps you have to go through and there are sentence stems for each of those steps. And it's an exercise to learn a skill. There's nothing romantic at all about it. It produces romance, but it's not romantic. It's sort of like if you're going to play tennis, you have to train this muscle to hold the tennis racket in a counter, non-natural way. Because if you hold it naturally, you'll never hit the, you'll always hit it too far or too short. But if you train this muscle until it's integrated, anytime you pick up a racket, your hand will go in the right direction. You'll swing it and it'll go just over the net and you'll be a tennis player. Well, dialogue is a skill in that mechanical sense. This is what couples hate the most. Everybody we've taught it to. So it's so mechanical. And we say, yes, it is. All skills are mechanical until they are developed and integrated. And then they become art forms. Then you become creative once you integrate the skill and you want to say something. Well, when you said, well, how can we get along if we disagree with everything? No. Say, okay, I have the answer is uh, part of uh, this uh, dialogue and, and the process is learning to shift from judgment to curiosity and wonder. In a healthy relationship, you do not judge each other. You ever you, about anything you notice that they're different and we teach you ways to wonder about them. Mm -hmm. And so part of the dialogue process is when you say when someone says something you absolutely disagree with. So you go, uh, may I mirror back what I just heard you say mm -hmm. and you mirror and the person says uh, and then I say, Do, did I get it right? And you said, yes, you got mm -hmm. it right. Mm -hmm. Uh, Imar, the second thing that person is supposed to say is, is there more about that? Well, when you say, is there more to the other person, they relax mm -hmm. because suddenly and why it is looks that? like you're interested they in are, that. Because you're like, interested. Like it's, a, it's like you care. So, And we didn't mean for the three words, is there more to be so meaningful, but everyone said, oh, that's the magic phrase. Mm -hmm. But also, um, when is there more? When the person says that, they move from that lower judge, bro, lower brain, judgmental brain, like that's wrong. I don't want to hear about it. I, you're wrong. Or the left brain uh, hemisphere of th there's no way you can prove that that's right. <laughs> I know I can prove that you're wrong, but in the moment, I'll say, is there more? And that's what puts you in the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. There's a neuroscientist, Dan Siegel, who says living in the uh, uh, um, this part of the brain, the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, promotes neural integration. It is the healthiest part of the brain to live in, mm -hmm. and he calls it the Dalai Lama state. No. It's the state of <laughs> not knowing. State. And yeah. it is fun to live in a relationship where you not know. And the society rewards you for knowing. So um, we're about to write a book on wonder. Y'all, anyone listening, it feels so good to wonder. I used to be great at, um, <clears throat> quote, improving Harville. For his sake. A lot of work. <laughs> for his sake. <laughs> well, he didn't want to be improved. I mean, he did a little bit of, when we were first dating, but... And when we married, I said, hey, let's get the book written. And I helped. I was sort of an invaluable support at that time. But then I kept wanting to improve him. He did, well, you did not help me like really being in my presence. I really improved my wardrobe. <laughs> we're much better oh, clothes. But, but, but <laughs> you were not happy with no. being married to me no. until I stopped talking and just enjoyed listening. You know, if he needs a new shirt, someone else can tell him. Yeah. I don't have to tell him. <laughs> wonder about him and he's a big boy <laughs> so
So it's just amazing how much uh, talking is attempting to shape the other person. And you, and so that means you know what they should be or become. And right. you don't. And what Helen, Helen uh, really makes a case for, and she's going to write a whole book on wonder. And the, the, the main focus about uh, getting to wonder is that you don't know. It's a reality. You have no idea what is going on in your partner's brain until they say what's going on. And then you say, well, no, that's not what's going on. That's, that's not what I thought. No. <laughs> so not knowing then uh, opens you to wonder. And now when you're in to wonder, you get a whole new world that lives here in your house to enrich what life is like. And that's been my growth, uh, my growth challenge and my growth benefit is that Helen is, lives in such a different world. And I get to live in that. She's intuitive. She has gut reading. She can figure out people. It takes me two weeks. She does it in two minutes. Um, this, and she has, a, you know, art and there's all kinds of things going on there. And if I listen to her, I get enriched. But if I start judging her, I deflect her. But if I receive her, I get enriched and, and vice versa. And it's, it's that simple. And we call it differentiating so you can connect because you're never connected to somebody unless you know them as they are rather than as you wish they would be for you, which is what Buber would call an it. Right. So, so I want to share with you that, you know, you kind of um, went through the stages of dialogue that when I had to mirror my partner for the first time, uh, neither of us were able to repeat what we just heard mm -hmm. um, for weeks. <laughs> and, and this has just been said with a witness, and we, and it's just the ability we hear, I, I don't want to speak for everybody, but I hear different things than those being said to me. And it requires a real, I call it what, what you guys call, um, you know, you talked about the, the practice, I call going to the gym. It's like the yeah. working out, yeah, right? Exactly. So, yeah. so, so developing so that. If you, if uh, those of you who don't know what neuroplasticity is, mm -hmm. who are watching this, get a book on current brain science and you, you can change your brain yeah. and, but it takes practice. It's just do what Imar said. Yeah. Like, and it's yeah. it's called brain training yeah. and yeah. and you can yeah. and i've experienced it it feels so good yeah. to yeah. learn to um when you don't use um certain parts of the brain anymore ever and you 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 it's it's sort of like a spiritual practice all the time just yeah. make listening of make people a wonder instead of screwed up so and, I, and judge them as bad. Just make, wonder why they think that. And I will tell you, your relationships will appreciate it, but you are the winner because yeah. you get to feel a life of wonder. Yeah, It's fun. Yeah, that's what I want to say as a kind of off ramp because we're going to have to go. But when you engage in this dialogical process, so you differentiate, so you can connect, you get two things. Uh, one, you get uh, to be healthy, yeah, physically, emotionally, and you get a better brain. Because any time you dialogue, your brain has to reorganize itself away from looking out for you to uh, being curious about the other. And that's a new neuronal pattern. And if you do that over and over again, your neurons rearrange themselves. It's called neuroplasticity. So you get a better integrated brain by using the dialogue process, the dialogue process creates safety. <sighs> so now you get the neurochemicals of dopamine and uh, acetylcholine, acetylcholine and uh, norepinephrine and, 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 and endorphins and yeah. endorphins yeah. running through you. So your immune system is strengthening. You get to live longer and have fewer diseases. It's peaceful. You sleep better. So there's better. no loss to giving up the self as center for the relationship is center and you're moving into the love process, which is the, uh, which is the, is what we just talked about. And you start all that by saying the first thing you do 
Um, and, uh, and this as this, nobody does either, which is, so I'd like, I want to talk to you, Amir. So when I walk into the room, I usually just come and say, Amir, blah, 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 blah. You end that forever. And you walk into the room and say, Amir, is now a good time to talk with you about um, what we're going to do for dinner or what we're going to what we're going to talk about on this interview? So you start all conversations with an appointment. Now, that sounds so unromantic, but what it means is you stop crossing boundaries because when you cross a boundary, you create fear, which produces anxiety and then produces a defense and you're doing all kinds of bad things. But if I say, hey, is now a good time to talk about it. you can say well let me see not really i think i can be be available in about 15 minutes would that be okay so now you're into the collaboration process and that's safe but if i just walk in and start talking to you and you're not available you're a nice guy you'd probably sort of nod your head and listen and so forth but you you couldn't listen because you're running your own movie and you're watching right. your own movie and I'm saying, hey, let me run my movie on your screen. And that's a violation of you. So you start with an appointment. Then anytime you hear somebody talk, you say, let me see if I got that. And then you check. Did I get it right? Did I get it? And then you do what Helen said. You say, well, is there more about that? And that's the curiosity piece. And ultimately, you say, you make sense. And then ultimately, you say, and I can imagine that when you had that experience, you must have felt, and that means empathy, that you must have felt glad, sad, mad, or scared. So now you're in the dialogical space, and everything good is going to come out of that. And that's what we have launched Safe Conversations as a social, global social movement to teach everybody on the planet how to have a safe conversation, which means to engage in the dialogical process. So that's sort of, that's sort of us uh, in a nutshell. Yeah. So two two more questions. Is that okay? How how are we on time? I know we, we started late and I and I am really grateful for your generosity. If not, I, that's I think we both are four minutes into another uh oh, session. Oh, so we're it. gonna have to um say goodbye I, with that. I really I really want to thank you so much for your time. I thank the audience. We have a lot of comments here. Um safe conversations. Uh, you just um made me think so much about wonder and curiosity. So I came in to listen, and I feel like uh, curiosity and wonder is something beautiful I'm taking away uh, today. I really appreciate your generous time and, and wisdom, and look forward to uh, collaborate more in the future. Um, oh, we'd love to. We'd love to come back and answer the other questions. And yeah, we'd we'll be, be delighted. We yep. love. I'm I'm really liking meeting you. Yeah, and, um, you've yeah. known us so long. I'm glad now to know. Yeah you so it's reciprocal so call us whenever you're ready yeah we'd Thank love so to much. have a second yeah Listen, we'd we'll, love we'll, do, we'll do that okay. okay really appreciate that and we'll let you go okay, okay. thank you thank very you. much Arthur. thank you